Boom, and we're live. What's happening, beautiful people? Happy Monday, everyone. Good morning, America. Good afternoon, Europe. And welcome, everyone, to our live stream. How are you guys doing this afternoon? Let me know how you're doing in the comments box below. And if you like what you see, guys, or if you don't like what you see, please share and subscribe, guys, and annoy your friends or your enemies with our daily broadcasts. Come on, be supportive. Don't be haters. Now, let's get down to business and see what is happening in the markets on this beautiful Monday, 22nd of February, 2021. Quiet, uh, quiet economic calendar this Monday with the only good news coming from the uh, German IFO business climate data this morning showing an increase that pushed the euro a tad higher during the European trading session. In other news, guys, we have the US stock markets pointing to another lower opening today with the Dow Jones, uh, the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq all pointing downwards. Great day for trading metals today as copper futures, iron ore, zinc and aluminium traded at their highest levels since 2018. Federal Reserve Chairman Jerome Powell will testify uh, Tuesday and Wednesday in the U.S. Congress, keeping investors on the cautious side until then. More issues for Boeing guys after posting one of the most depressing earnings last week as uh, some uh, 777 aircraft were grounded again after an engine of a Boeing 777 caught fire shortly after takeoff over the weekend in Denver, Colorado. Crude oil resumes rally today, uh, trading just above $60 a barrel on news that Texas refineries are getting back to normal. And Bitcoin guys topped $58,300 over the weekend, but retracted to $53,000 today after Elon Musk's comments on social media that cryptos are trading high. Some uh, traders claim the correction uh, was uh, more of a technical uh, thing and not triggered by any news. But stay tuned, guys. Right, then we're back, guys, with my guest for today from the sunny London, Neil Wilson, Chief Market Analyst at Markets.com. Neil, happy Monday. How are you? Yeah, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, it's not so sunny this morning. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty wet and miserable here. <laughs> back to the good old uh, London weather. <laughs> yeah. Right. Bitcoin almost stopped 60K over the weekend, but thank God we had Elon Musk's uh, tweets to calm the markets down a bit. <laughs> Ethereum of $2,000, Bitcoin almost 60K. What a madness, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's as, you know, one thing's for sure no one's using this as a currency right now. Um, there's no way you're transacting in Bitcoin. Um, I, it just, it, no, no one's going to be doing that. And, uh, people are just sitting on sitting on it, um, hoping that it goes up. And I was just worried that if that's what you're doing, that's what everyone else is doing. And eventually, the the, the penny drops, and and uh, and the the bottom comes out the market. We might be seeing that. I mean, we're seeing a big pullback right now. It's uh, on the charts. It's um, uh, really going for. It. I mean, the futures in particular are down at nearly 50k. Um, I think spot is what it was last time I looked. It was just under fifty-two, but it's probably fifty-one now. I mean, it's really, um, really just come out this afternoon. Um, I mean, Musk's tweets always funny, but he said exactly the same thing about Tesla shares um, back in May, uh, May last year. He said that the shares were too high, and in my opinion, I think he, that tweet over the weekend about Bitcoin was actually a bit of an in joke about that. Um, and you know, Tesla shares are up five. 100 since he tweeted that so uh, you know i don't i don't think it has any bearing on it as such um but uh yeah the market's going to move and i think you know as i said uh, in my morning note i think um we've already had a 30 percent drawdown in bitcoin uh, this year from the january 8th peak to the january 21st low uh, it dropped 30 percent so 30 percent off uh, that 58,000 would take you down to 40,000. So I think, you know, near term support is at 40,000. Wow, it's really going for it now. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. So that's, you know, I easily see 40,000. Check this out, Neil. As we speak in live, guys, breaking news, breaking news. Bitcoin is currently trading at $48,383. Bitcoin shed over $9,000 within the last 24 hours. How do you call that? 
Ah, uh, well, it's it's just Bitcoin. It's what <laughs> it's just what happens with Bitcoin. I'm afraid. Um, once people, uh, once you get a bit of selling, it, it's not very liquid. It's still not very liquid. It's still, you know, it's still not a massive market. There's, I mean, 21 million um, Bitcoin in circulation is is just not that. It's just not that many. There's not, and a lot of the a lot of the bitcoins that are, um, you know, out there are, are, are locked or they're owned by a handful of people. And so the, the the actual market of tradable bitcoins are really rather small, um, and therefore susceptible to um, these sort of moves. And also, as I said, it's just there's no fundamental value in Bitcoin. People are holding it, uh, hoping. Um, so if you've run up and you've made you've turned, you know, your thousand dollars into twenty thousand dollars over the last few weeks, then you know, you're probably gonna be uh, thinking about maybe maybe taking some profits. So there, there's there's always this risk with Bitcoin. I just I think but the key thing is is really the size of the market and just how illiquid it is. True. On the Thursday, uh, when we last spoke, I also had a very interesting uh, crypto chat with Chris Thomas as, at uh, Swiss Code Bank. And he was also saying that the Bitcoin correction is almost imminent and we might see it uh, going even as low as 17 or 20K. Do you see it as well, Neil? Uh, very possible. I think 20K would be in your, your big level. You know, that was the big sort of uh, breakout level. Um, it was where, you know, kind of hit the ceiling in 2017. Um, Yes, I think I think it's possible. I mean, that's a big, big retracement, though. I mean, that's um, you know that that's um, a, a, what is it a two thirds retracement? So, yeah, you're looking at that sort of um, kind of sixty one one percent uh, retrace, maybe on the fib. Um, be interesting to see actually where that sits exactly. But um, yeah, that that's definitely definitely possible. I think anything's possible with Bitcoin right now. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, Neil, I told you uh, last Thursday that we have a special week this week, so I will have a few questions for you today. Following a series of emails that I received last week, this week, I want to talk to you about the so-called trading gurus, as all the social media channels are absolutely f flooded with all sorts of, uh, of silly posts. Are you up for it? <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Perfect. Now, I know you also work with clients, right? Yeah, now and again. <laughs> right. Do people call you a trading guru, Neil? Uh, well, no, I wouldn't go as far as far to say that. I'm, I, I just tell, I just tell people what I think is going on and why. Um, you know, we've actually got um, we've got a bunch of guys um, who contribute to our, you know, our content and our platform um, on on X Ray. They they contribute video uh, video analysis. So we've got a, a bunch of different. Um, people who I would call gurus um, uh, who contribute um, every week. So that that's really how we we um, try and try and give our clients a bit of an edge uh, that way. What would you say defines a trading guru, Neil? Is there such a thing? Well, I mean, I guess I guess there's a track record. Maybe if you're if you're, you know, if you are a trader, um, you know, I'm I'm because I work for the company. I'm we're regulated, and I'm not able to give advice. So it's it's a different sort of scenario for me. Um, some of our partners were maybe able to to do so a bit more overtly, um, but I think you know experience, um, track record, um, not being someone that uh, promises too much is probably uh, a good indicator of of someone that you can trust. But. Uh, you know, there's lots of different, we've got we've got guy uh, Phil Carr who does our gold and silver reports. He's he uh, runs the gold and silver club and uh, advises his clients on on trading. Uh, with Andrew Barnett from Australia, um, who who focuses on FX and and certain equities as well. Um, and we've got sort of a range of different sort of views and, and trading techniques and te technical analysis people, fundamental analysis people, all sorts of different ones. Yeah, but they are professionals. Yeah, they are investment specialists, not the self-proclaimed uh, trading guru. Yeah, that's it. You know, we don't we don't have any of those guys. We've got you know they're they're either qualified technic technicians or they're qualified um, CFA or they're qualified in some way, shape, or form um, to talk about their particular corner of the market, and um, that's probably what um, is is the most important thing. How could people tell if they're dealing with a with a phony trading guru or a professional investment specialist or a technical analyst? 
Well, I think you get an inclination for the, the, the sort of language. You know, if you look at their social media profile, that probably tells you a lot, um, particularly if, if you've got these guys that are promoting a lifestyle rather than giving, you know, sort of sage kind of uh, responsible uh, signals or advice. Um, you know, we have um, signals from uh, Signal Center, for example, which is an FCA regulated company which delivers signals uh, within the platform and, and by email and so on. And uh, they, you know, they're actually regulated. They don't promote at a lifestyle. You don't see them posting pictures of speedboats and Lamborghinis. Um, you see them posting uh, updates on the market, and that's it. Exactly. Right. Okay. Now, one last question on this topic. What is your take on a post on social media of a trading platform that shows 20 trades on the same asset? Even though the trades are in profit, what does this tell you about that time of that type of trading strategy? Um, what twenty active, twenty open all at once, so, or or twenty? Yeah, I see every day. I see some some guru posting a, a screenshot with 20, 30, 40 trades on the VIX, for example, or on gold. They're all the same, so they're opening a cascade of trades on the same asset. Is that the right thing to do? I mean, uh, I wouldn't want to say too much. I mean, I think probably, probably, you, you, you know, everyone's got their different strategies. But it, um, I mean, it is it. It's not a scalping strategy. I, I mean, I'm not. Uh, no, it's a trend riding strategy, but it's completely out of the ordinary. I mean, it shows like a robot would would do it. Yeah, trading algorithm. But then I mean, again. We the point of opening 30 trades on the same asset well yeah i mean it's certainly certainly um i mean they're, they're just adding to the position so it's strong momentum maybe um sort of trade i mean it's hard to sorry it's hard to sort of say without without seeing the, the actual the actual thing but i would i tend to suggest that you want to stick to having one trade per asset open at any one time <laughs> that would be you know, the normal the normal way to do it right yes and preferably create a mini portfolio hedge your positions with other assets that are not related to the asset you're trading right then that's it yeah i think um uncorrelated hedging is probably a a, a good um a good approach but you know a lot of people just go on the conviction and, and work on a sort of clear technical strategy and therefore they say well that you know the, the these parameters have been hit therefore i'm going to go in um, and they may not want to hedge. Uh, they may prefer to seek, um, you know, a kind of a, a more direct, um, a more direct approach. Right. Whatever works for them. But once again, what are these gurus talking about? Right. Let's get down to business, Neil. What's hot in the week in the markets this week? Is it just me, or the stock markets are pointing to a potential big correction? Yeah, I think. Well, you could. I mean, yeah, you could be seeing the correction really taking hold now with the, the way interest rates are going up and bond yields are moving up. I think that's um, key. And the market's looking at that. Um, you look to see whether or not the Fed this week pushes back on the recent rise in bond yields. Uh, you've got a bunch of Fed speakers, Jay Powell's um, semi-annual testimony in Congress. That's Tuesday, Wednesday, I think. Uh, you've got Clarida, Richard Clarida, who's a sort of in the intellectual kind of focal point really he expresses the sort of intellectual argument uh, that's going on in the fed uh, best and he's he's speaking a couple of times and then we've got bowman we've got brainard um i think kaplan as well maybe today a bunch of different fed speakers so really this is their opportunity to push back on on interest rates moving up on yields moving higher um but i don't think they will i think they'll, they're, they're happy to see yields move higher as long as they get the growth um, and the employment, so they're, I think they're happy to let inflation run and let yields go up. The problem is that um, you know you start to see yields go up too much, and they're going to have to act. They might have, might have to look at yield curve control. They might have to actually try and uh, anchor that uh, longer term um, duration on on Treasury yields just to try and rein it back in because they don't want the U.S. government facing this massive uh, kind of bill for all its borrowing if it's borrowing it. I mean, it seems crazy for the Fed to be the, the U.S. government to be borrowing um, at you know sort of one and a half percent on a ten-year when in you know in Europe it's negative. Uh, that 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 doesn't make 
since, given all the action that the Fed's done already. And so, you know, you could see the Fed need to go deeper, um, deeper with this. And then even you get some discussion about negative rates, maybe, but uh, among Fed, among Fed uh, policymakers. I wouldn't be surprised if that happens. Now, also this week, we're going to have the 1.9 trillion stimulus bill going through the Senate. And that's very, very important. Probably they will accept it. Yeah, they have no, uh, no way around it. But I'm curious to see the reaction of the market when that uh, that goes through. Now, yeah, let's... I think you know, it's, it's, if you get the full the, the full stimulus, then the markets. I mean, the, the problem is the markets probably. Um, you know, we've had we've been dealing with this number. This number of 1.9 trillion has been floating around for so long now. It's, it's no. There's no benefit to, to passing it as such. It's, it's simply that um, the market's already worked on that basis. So um, I don't think there's any kind of um, discount in, in the market based on the idea that they won't pass it or anything like that. I think it's it's fully, fully priced, if you like. Right. Now, let's move on to happier things. Um, Wall Street Journal had reported last that Saudi Arabia wants to reverse the unilateral cut of 1 million barrels a day that uh, it made for February and March. What will that, uh, what would that do to the oil price, Neil? Well, I think it's, it's, again, it's, it's sort of largely expected. That, yeah, you got oil, I think it's a couple of bucks off the high. Um, uh, you know, that, that move by Saudi is kind of in line with what we we're expecting. I think the price is at $60. You know, they're a lot happier. Um, I think as long as demand comes through, then, you know, it's fine. I think that, that you've got to remember that that's the, the unilateral cut. It's not the um, it's not the, the sort of broad OPEC plus agreement. So really, I'd be more worried if OPEC plus uh, starts to unravel. You know, if you get Russia and others sort of really basically saying, look, we're done, guys, we're out. We're not cutting back. We're not going to hold back any longer. That, that would be the problem for the market. I don't think this is a big problem for the market. I think um, that, that, you know, the main thing is this OPEC plus deal and then whether or not actually you get $60 now, the shale producers really coming back in in force um, and they could start to, um, if they ramp supply, then, you know, that could start to weigh on, on prices. Right. Now, talking about commodities, I know you have a lot of uh, commodities uh, on your trading platform and commodities had a very good start this week, considering the tensions around the stimulus bill and all that. Would it be wise to have a look at other commodities as uh, as portfolio diversification this week, Neil? Yeah, I mean, you know, copper is at a 10-year high. you got platinum bursting out of multi-year highs. You know, all the, all the industrial metals are really pushing up, I think, because two factors really you got all this pent up demand uh this year stimulus uh, uh as well and then you've got a supply deficit in 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 things like copper and platinum um and that is driving this gain this uh, rally um whether or not it can be sustained i guess is is um is up for debate but i think there's a belief among a lot of the market watchers that there's there's, there is further to go on this. That the, the supply, the deficit of supply, is really uh, quite bad, and, and, and you will see prices go up even further. I mean, this all plays into the, the inflation and yield debate. But um, you know, I think commodities are a pretty good space, and you know, you've got this sort of idea that um, you're actually at the beginning of a, a multi-year commodity su super cycle, um, and that that would really be um, a very very you know obviously very bullish for for a lot of these metals um and we saw you know we saw some of the the, the uk mining stocks really doing well because they're able to up their dividend quite quite uh, substantially so um that's another one you sort of leverage play on on the mining on on metals prices is actually looking at some of these mining stocks because of the dividend that you can get from them also, look at the soft ones. Uh, look at cocoa, for example. What an amazing rally for cocoa today. Almost 2,500 flat, as things stand right now. Yeah, um, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, softs are doing well. You know, soybeans and corn have, have really outperformed. Um, again, it seems to be, um, you know, mi mix of factors, but simply the fact that, that um, you've got this 
this demand for all this stuff is really is is really really power, really really strong right now and uh, getting it to to the right people is is tougher and you know you've got um a, sh a shortage of um of shipping containers and so on and that that's sort of fact as well that's been a factor as well and i think another one that i've seen lately is um lumber prices really going through the roof and and that's because of all this you know building pent up building demand in in the us as well so yeah, commodities across the board looking very strong. So especially the soft ones or the energy ones uh, might be a good uh, good asset to have a look at, uh, at least this week. Yeah, while the, um, the money markets are a bit uh, bumpy, let's say, uh, awaiting for the end of the testimony of uh, Jerome Powell on Wednesday. Yeah, for sure. I think that there's definitely uh, something to be looked at there. Awesome. Neil Wilson, happy Monday once again. Thank you ever so much for, uh, for being us today. Are you going to wear another hat? Are you going to surprise us with your amazing hairstyle on Thursday? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't think so. I think I'll just let it grow out now. Well, well, I, cut it. One. I shaved my one when the first lockdown started. <laughs> right, Neil, thank you ever so much for, for being with us today. Have a good week and I'll talk to you on uh, on Thursday.